Good morning. Uh, like Pastor said, my name is Michael Butak. If I haven't met you before, hello. Um, I think, I was thinking about it this morning, I think we've lived in Twin for three years. Like, it could be today. I'm not sure. It's about this time three years ago. So, anyway, time has flown by uh, since we've been here. But anyway, I'm very thankful to have the opportunity to, to speak to you this morning. So today we're going to talk about the biblical account of the earth. This is an apo- apologetic message that is based on the Genesis flood. It's really meant to complement the series that Pastor Paul has been teaching through in the book of Genesis. The purpose of this message this morning is to strengthen biblical faith. And biblical faith means confidence in the declarations of the Bible. It's a confidence that doesn't need to have an explanation for everything in order to believe it. And biblical faith, in my understanding, also does not have a need to always force everything into a philosophical system or reconcile it to human taste or human wisdom. So it is my prayer that in some small way today's message can help build up the faith of each one of us. As has already been said, this message is a message on creation science or creationism, which is a topic that I love. Defined broadly, creation science is just science from a biblical foundation. We've become so accustomed in our culture to science being associated with secularism that we almost think that science comes from secularism, which is not at all the case. Secularists secularists like to pretend that they brought the world science, but science is a fruit of Christianity and it's a flower that grew in the soil of, of, of Christian truth. And so today I want to focus on a very specific aspect of, cre- of creation science. I want to focus on how the Genesis flood enables us to understand the physical earth that we're standing on. We're going to talk about rocks, but we're not just going to talk about physical rocks, we're going to talk about rocks in our thinking. I know I've had rocks in my thinking. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. The the things that I'm going to share today have occupied a lot of thought in my life over many years. And so I'm very excited to share them with you. They've, They've had a very big impact on my life and have helped to relieve an enormous amount of confusion for me. I pray that you will also find these ideas beneficial for your Christian walk. So let's get into it. What's the biblical account of the earth? I don't know if anybody can recognize this picture. It was taken just north of Twin Falls. I didn't take it, but Google did. Um, Maybe you've looked at some remarkable characteristic in the surface of the earth and wondered, hmm, you know, what happened here? I'll never forget the first time that I came to Twin Falls. It was 2003. And if you don't know it, I'm from Wisconsin. And Wisconsin, if you haven't been there, uh, it's tons of lakes and rivers and trees, not too many mountains. <clears throat> no mountains. And so when I came to the West, all the, and, and I was seeing the mountains, I felt like I was in like a, a calendar uh, picture or, or, or something. You know, it was like you know, magic to see mountains. And so maybe you can imagine what a thrill it was for me to be here. Anyway, as I came down Highway 93 north of town here, before you get to the canyon, I saw something I didn't expect, and I have a picture of one of them here. Alongside the road, on both sides, there are these fissures in the earth, where it looks like the earth burst open like a TV dinner in the microwave. Has anybody seen these things? Okay. I don't know if you had any similar reaction, or maybe you grew up around it, and it didn't, you know, strike you as strange, but... I was like, I'm glad I wasn't here when that happened. And then, of course, you know, came over the Prime Bridge, and I saw the mind-boggling, beautiful canyon. And if you've ever been to other places like Grand Canyon or Zions National Park, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, you can see that the world bears scars of a catastrophic, watery past. What's the biblical account of all these things? Why does the earth look the way that it does? Just got a couple of pictures here as we're thinking about it. What happened to the earth? Why does it look like this? 
I'm borrowing Pastor Paul's advertisement for the um, Wilderness Institute of Biblical Manhood. Great picture here. What in the world? What happened here? It's beautiful. And here, you've got layers of earth going this way, butted up against layers of earth going this way. It's natural and okay to say, wow, you know, what's this about? Now, why is this important? Isn't it just enough to know that God created the earth and there it is? Yes, that is enough. So why bother talking about this? Why is this important? <clears throat> it's because we have gotten so many mixed messages about the earth that we are confused, and confusion erodes faith. I want to share about, a little bit about this from my own experience as a young Christian dealing with this problem, and it has to do with my education. All right, two pictures here. Can you guys see this? Now, even though I was raised attending a Bible-believing church denomination, and I always believed, as I was taught in Sunday school, that God created the world just as it says in Genesis, like many of you, I had a secular education, which was steeped in evolutionary explanations for everything. These evolutionary explanations were completely at odds with the Bible's explanation of everything, including the earth itself. As you look at these two pictures, you see two incompatible stories, two opposing worldviews. Do they reconcile with each other? A lot of people have tried to reconcile them. I wouldn't recommend it. What's a kid to do on Sunday morning when he's given a coloring page with Noah's Ark and then Monday through Friday the coloring pages have cavemen being attacked by a saber-toothed tiger or, or uh, <coughs> Tyrannosaurus Rex having a brontosaurus for breakfast? The coloring pages aren't telling the same story. Now, it didn't really hit me until I was like 12 years old that these two explanations of where everything com come from contradicted one another. <clears throat> and the science that I was taught at school was presented in a way that seemed to fit the evolutionary explanation of the earth and contradict the Bible's account of the earth. The way they depicted science, especially, contradicted what the Bible said about the earth being created 6,000 years ago. And then there were these lessons about buried fossils and layers upon layers of rock that supposedly accumulated, you know, very, very, very gradually and slowly over, you know, millions or billions of years. You know, that was the explanation for where the rock layers came from. It takes unspeakably long time for them to accumulate. This explanation for the layered look of the earth was just presented as a fact. When you see rocks, you're looking at something that took millions of years to, to, to form. Now, when I realized that there was a contradiction between my faith and my education, I had to make a decision which explanation I was going to believe. And I would sub submit to you for your consideration that education is never spiritually neutral. As Jesus said, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters abroad. So I, I submit to you that education either serves to build up Christian faith or it serves to tear down Christian faith. And this is the situation that I was in as a 12-year-old boy. My education was like a jackhammer chiseling away at the foundation of my Christian faith. I had to decide, was I going to agree with the Bible or was I going to agree with secularism? And although I was young, I knew that rejecting the Bible's account of the earth meant rejecting Jesus. But Jesus was way too compelling for me to want to reject him. He was way too amazing, and his promises were way too wonderful and hopeful for me to just throw away. So even though I couldn't understand the things that I was taught in school, I remember deciding that I was going to believe the Bible. That was, that was a, a distinct memory that I have. You see, God was working in my young heart and helping me. This conviction went with me through my teen years and into my college days where I got a, actually got a lot more serious about my faith and started to go to Bible studies and Christian meetings on campus. But although I was growing spiritually, my faith was still handicapped 
by the confusion brought in by my, by, by my education. So you see, you can be a Christian and you can be completely convinced that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God, and you can honestly and, and sincerely and thoroughly reject evolution as the origin of life. But if your only explanation for the rocks is from a secular perspective, you're liable to have confusion and doubt and frustration in your life. And this was my experience. Like I said, I soundly rejected evolution, but I had no explanation for the appearance of the Earth itself, with its layers of rock and buried fossils, other than what I had been taught in school, other than that the Earth was a product of blind processes over eons of time. So in other words, I believe the Earth was only 6,000 years old, but I couldn't help but think the Earth looked billions of years old. Can you understand where I'm coming from? Has anybody, you know, experienced some element of that in your own life? This confusion. But why did the earth look billions of years old to me? As I said, it was, it, was, it was from school. But what was it about my education that made me think this way? I want to talk about this. I think it's, it's, it's extremely helpful and important. You see, in my thinking, I was wearing a pair of glasses. We're all wearing glasses. I'm not talking about physical glasses. I'm talking about glasses in the way that we think and the way that we see the world. I was wearing glasses that just simply said, rocks are billions of years old. So whenever I saw a rock, I was like, well, that was billions of years old. I'm like, wait, no. <laughs> it's not billions of years old. It's 6,000 years old, like the Bible says. But I, you know, I had this contradiction within me and this confusion. You know, I had to come up with a way to cope with this. So I thought, maybe if I just close my eyes when I see a rock, I won't be confused, right? And so, you know, this worked okay until, you know, married Rachel and moved to Idaho and had to drive between Boise and Twin Falls where there's you know, all these majestic rock formations and so it got a lot more difficult to you know, close my eyes when I saw rocks. So, so anyway, all, all, all joking aside, these nagging doubts can actually be very destructive. And this confusion and doubt is the problem really that I'm hoping to address, hoping to, if there's an element of it that you've experienced in your life, to replace that with the peace and, and understanding that God's word can give when we have a biblical account of the earth. And this is not just for people who've had a secular education. Even if you were fortunate enough to have a, a biblical education, you are no doubt confronted at times by evolutionary explanations from you know, books, movies, novels, in the workplace, etc. So I want you, all of you, if you haven't heard it, to know that when it comes to the study of the earth, there is another side of the story that they don't tell you in secular education, one that profoundly confirms the Bible's account of the earth. And I want you to walk with absolute confidence in every word of God and to be free from any doubt or confusion that God's word is truth. The Bible gives an account of the earth in a way that explains the physical state of the earth, the facts on the ground, far, far better than the so-called scientific explanations of secularism. You see, the Bible is at odds with secularism, if I go back to this slide. It doesn't go, the Bible does not go with that. <clears throat> but the Bible is not at odds with the physical world around us. There is a harmony between the Bible and the, and the earth. In fact, I believe it is the Bible that unlocks our ability to begin to understand the world around us. So just repeat that, everybody. Kids, the Bible is what unlocks our ability to understand everything. What I'm focusing on this morning is that it locks, unlocks our ability to understand the earth. So, okay, I'm sure you guys have maybe noticed this really great, big, long, funny word on the slide here, uniformitarianism. All right, everybody say it with me. Uniformitarianism. It's nine syllables. Okay, uniformitarianism is the idea behind evolution that makes evolution evolution. Uniformitarianism. When Charles Darwin came up with his theory of evolution, he was just applying uniformitarianism 
to biology to come up with an explanation for the origin of species. It's uniformitarianism. That's, that's the underlying idea. And secular education is very much steeped in uniformitarianism. And because of that, our society is steeped in uniformitarianism. But what is uniformitarianism? It is the idea that what you see right now is all that ever has been. That's it. It's very, very simple. Uniformitarians, most of our society, believes that all that exists is what you can see. And it's all that ever has existed. So what do I see? I see wind, rain, heat, snow, rocks, gravity, erosion, volcanoes, asteroids, electromagnetic energy from the sun. That's all I see. So that's all I have to work with to explain reality. It's all I have to work with to explain the past, the present, and the future. Uniform, uniformitarianism preaches one uniform existence with no supernatural input from the outside. Outside of nature. There's no creator God who created the world in uniformitarianism. Because why? I, I don't see a God anywhere. I don't see a creator God. And there's no miracle working God who ever intervened in human history. Again, because I don't see him. That's what the, how uniformitarianism thinks. Uniformitarianism is slavery to the five senses. The best analogy I've ever heard, and um, I'm going to reference this several times this morning, to understand uniformitarianism and how it explains why we have these glasses that say the earth is billions of years old. <laughs> the, best the best analogy I've heard is to think of a detective who's investigating a man's death. So this detective is called into the scene of the death and he finds this body laying on the floor, and the dead man has a bullet in his heart. But because the investigator looks around and he sees no criminal, he sees no culprit with a gun, he concludes that there never could have been anyone with a gun. There, there's, you can't use that to explain this man's death. He's forced to explain the man's death by natural causes, and so the investigator takes in all the facts on the ground, and he says, this man was not murdered. He's, he insists, this man must have eaten lead paint when he was a child, and somehow, over a long, long period of time, the lead in his system formed into a mass that is just coincidentally the same size and shape as a 9 millimeter bullet. But that part's just a coincidence. By some process not yet discovered, the lead mass became lodged in his heart. Now, as to the hole in his chest, that may have been caused by high blood pressure or a genetic defect. But with more studies, this too will be explained. One thing we know for sure, this man died of natural causes. Now, the obvious explanation for the man's death, that someone shot him with a gun, is just not acceptable to the uniformitarian because he can't see it. And so in the same way uniformitarians cannot accept a supernatural explanation to the origins of the universe or the history of the earth. So, if you look at the world and you think, hmm, billions of years, it's because you've been taught to wear the glasses of uniformitarianism. It's the worldview of our day. So in case it's not obvious, let me tell you that uniformitarianism is not the worldview of the Bible. So don't try mixing them together. They are polar opposites. As I've already said, the Bible is not at odds with the physical world around us. It is merely at odds with the fake news of uniformitarianism. And uniformitarianism is at odds with the physical world around us. It is uniformitarianism that has to come up with strange explanations. So with the time that remains this morning, I want to share some evidences from the physical earth itself that testify to the Bible's account. That testify to the Bible's account of the earth. Okay? The really interesting thing is that most of these evidences were discovered by secular scientists. It's really funny. Now, let's start. Well, before, before we do, for the sake of the kids, I want to pause and explain a word. All right, kids? I want to explain a word that you might not know. This word is sediment. Sediment. Sediment means the solids that settle to the bottom of a liquid, okay? So have any of you 
kids ever played in the mud and got like really covered in mud? I know I did when I was a kid. Any, any of you ever get really covered in mud? Or any grown-ups ever? Okay, I want to admit to it. Um, well, so, you know, probably mom would not be very happy. And probably she would um, hose you off before she brought you in the house. But what if she didn't hose you off? What if she just brought you in and put you in the bathtub covered in mud? When you were done washing, what would be in the bottom of the tub? Yeah, sediment. Dirt. That's what sediment is. It's, it's, it's the stuff that sinks to the bottom and settles. All right? So when we're talking about the earth, we're, the earth is covered in sediment, or it's covered in dirt that settles in layers. And sometimes these layers of dirt get squashed down so tight that they turn into rock. Sedimentary rock. So this used to be sediment. I mean, that's the idea. And it's... It's now a rock. It got squashed into a rock. Okay? All right. Back to the flood. I'm going to read from Genesis chapter 7 some highlights about the flood. Okay? If you want to follow along, I'm going to be reading between verses 11 and 24, but I'm going to be skipping a little bit here just for the sake of time. So in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day, of the month, all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. All flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle, beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life, all that was on the dry land died. And so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth, and only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Okay, so what we have here is a story of an immense, immense flood of water that came simultaneously from the fountains of the deep, which is some kind of water in the earth, and from the heavens above. Now, virtually all creation science researchers have come to the conclusion that when the Bible speaks of water coming from the fountains of the deep and covering the earth, that this involves some kind of unthinkably huge tsunami-like waves of water that swept across the continents of the earth, literally wiping the bowl clean and burying everything. And I don't know about you, but to me, this is one of the most scary things I can imagine. In a couple dec- decades ago, we saw the devastating power of tsunamis in Indonesia and Thailand and Japan. And they were caused by earthquakes under the sea. You know, tsunamis not only drown everybody, everything in its path, but they actually have the power to reshape the surface of the earth, that kind of energy in moving water. And so I just want to suggest to you that the best way to understand the devastation of the Genesis flood is to understand it as including a series of tsunamis of such enormous magnitude that they literally washed over and reshaped the surface of the earth and buried all life under great layers of mud, dirt, and sediment. And I think if you consider the wording of Genesis chapter 7, this is consistent with this mysterious statement about the the, the fountains of the deep being um, broken up. And there's actually a very interesting passage in 2 Peter on this point. When Peter is speaking of unbelievers, he says... It escapes their notice that the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at that time was destroyed, being flooded with water. So when the flood destroyed the earth, the earth that we see today was formed. Like, I mean, it's the same earth, but in, in the shape and in the, the layout that we see today. The earth was formed out of water and by water when it was destroyed by the flood. All right, now, let's look at 10 evidences 
that what the flood describes in the Bible, that what the Bible describes of the flood is exactly what happened. Okay? The first evidence I want to share is that ocean fossils cover the entire earth. Let me quote an article from Answers in Genesis. This is a ministry, creation science ministry. We find fossils of sea creatures in rock layers that cover all the continents. For example, most of the rock layers in the walls of the Grand Canyon, which is more than a mile above sea level, contain marine fossils. Boys and girls, marine fossils means ocean creatures. Fossilized shellfish are even found in the Himalayas. The whole earth is covered in ocean fossils. And this is really tricky for the uniformitarians. You know, you got the investigator trying to explain the dead guy with, you know, from dying of natural causes. They have these theories that the continents have risen and fallen many times over billions of years and that the oceans came in and washed over the continents and then retreated off of them and then washed, you know, just kind of like the continents got dunked a whole bunch of times. And that's their explanation for how um, layers of rock and sediment and fossilized sea creatures are found everywhere, the whole earth. Anywhere you, you, you search, you'll, you'll find fossilized sea creatures anywhere on the planet. But that explanation about the continents rising and falling, it's fake news, the fake news of uniformitarianism. How about we just simply believe what Genesis tells us? The oceans once covered the entire earth when God judged it in a great flood. Evidence two, water, water everywhere. This is really um, closely connected to the, to the first one. Even according to secular scientists, the entire Earth was once underwater. A March 2020 article from astronomy.com says, while modern Earth's surface is about 70% covered in water, new research indicates that our planet was a true ocean world some three billion years ago. See also a March 2021 paper from Harvard University. Earth itself was once a water world with its own global ocean. There are a lot of articles, especially in the last couple of years, on this topic. And isn't that interesting that they come to the conclusion that the Earth was once covered in water? We know why. It's not complicated. God flooded the world. And continuing on this point, have you ever dug a hole in your backyard and found a smooth stone? You know, a round, not jagged, but kind of rounded stone? I know I definitely have. When I was a kid, I used to visit my cousins in the next town over, and they had a neighbor who owned this little machine called a rock tumbler. Now, a rock tumbler has a drum that turns, and um, before you turn it on, you put water and some stones and some sand inside of it, and you seal it up, and you put it on the machine, and it, and it just turns for like weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And over time, it'll polish the stones that you put in there, and they'll come out as shiny as glass. Now imagine that the earth is a giant rock tumbler and God has opened up the fountains of the deep and the continents are washed away and laid back down again by just staggering volumes of water at a global scale. Repeated again and again until everything in the earth has been washed away and the entire surface of the earth has been remade. Those smooth stones in your backyard bear the marks of that fateful flood. Okay, here's a third evidence, the massive fossil graveyards that cover the planet. Okay, what you're looking at here is a fossil graveyard in Alberta, Canada. This is one of the most remarkable fossil graveyards that's ever been found. As you can see, this is not just one dead dinosaur, this is a jumbled up pile of dead dinosaurs that were all buried at once. The dinosaur grave is so huge it covers almost a square mile. And a pair of secular scientists describe it this way. Data from this mega bone bed, where was I? Data from this mega bone bed provide pretty clear evidence that these and other dinosaurs were wiped out by a catastrophic tropical storm that flooded what was once a coastal lowland here in Alberta. So you can hear their uniformitarianism in their thinking, but did you hear that they concluded that these beasts were buried in a flood of water from the sea? You see, when an animal dies and falls to the ground, normally it, its remains decompose, scavengers come and eat it, and you know, if you come back, if you, if you see a dead deer today, 
and come back in 10 years, you don't have a fossilized deer laying there. It isn't like getting buried slowly and turning into a fossil. It's gone. It's been eaten. You maybe could find a bone or two. All right? So um, the secularists, with their uniformitarian glasses, they talk out of both sides of their mouth. On the one hand, every inch of sedimentary rock took millions of years to form. But on the other hand, these animals were buried suddenly and rapidly and were completely preserved without being you know, dismembered or decomposing. <clears throat> I'll tell you what makes more sense. The earth is a giant graveyard from a great and su sudden burial event that occurred 4,000 years ago. So these, these fossil graveyards are actually fairly common. In Agate Springs, Nebraska, they found a, a fossil graveyard that they think has 9,000 animals in it. It has the remains of rhinos, three-toed horses, camels, giant wild boars, birds, plants, trees, seashells, and fish mixed and in intermingled with the other animals in great confusion. Okay, how do you get camels and sea creatures buried in the same grave? I'd like to understand that one. Well, I think we do understand it. Okay, here's a few more examples of fossil graveyards as part of this evidence. You're looking at a fossilized nest of baby dinosaurs. Okay, apart from the fact that it's kind of sad, we have to conclude that they were buried suddenly or scavengers would have carried them away and eaten them. They wouldn't, they wouldn't look the way that they do. This is a school of fish. Did all these fish just happen to die at the same time and lay down in the shape of a school of fish and then get buried gradually? No, I, I would say it looks like they were buried suddenly by a wave of sand. <clears throat> Let me tell you about a few others. Has anybody been to Dinosaur National Monument? I've, I've never been there, but I would love to go there. It contains one of the greatest known assemblages of, of, di of fossilized dinosaurs. And how do secular scientists explain how these dinosaurs got buried? Well, according to Ross Pomeroy, one of these scientists, the animal carcasses were caught in the current of a great river <laughs> and deposited in a sandbar. What he fails to mention is that there are also fossilized sea creatures in the same sediment. In southern Chile, scientists have discovered a grave of 46 ichthyosauruses. And the ichthyosauruses, they're not exactly dinosaurs, but they're, they're like large dolphin-like creatures. Okay? And if you ask the, the scientists how were all 46 of these ichthyosauruses buried together, they'll say that this was a pack of ichthyosauruses that were swimming together when they were suddenly drowned by mud flows. And their best guess is mud flows from an avalanche or an earthquake. Well, you've got to hand it to them. They're quite creative in trying to explain how the dead man has a bullet in his, in his heart using natural, <laughs> natural explanations. Anybody want to see a picture of a fossilized ichthyosaurus? Okay, this is a fossilized ichthyosaurus. And she's a female. How do we know? She was buried suddenly while giving birth. Again, the rapid burial of fossils testifies to the Bible's account of the earth. Here's another one. And this is one of my favorite fossils. This is actually a mummified Borealopelta. It's, a, it's an armored plant-eating dinosaur. So, like, I don't know how clear this is. This is his, this is his head with the armored spines of his neck and back, or her neck and back sticking out. So this is the eye, the nose down here. <clears throat> this was found in a Canadian mine in 2011. Now, listen to the uniformitarian explanation of how he was buried. It must have been washed out to sea, perhaps by a flood. You, you see the theme here? Even they have to admit that the only way that these creatures could have been buried is with a flood. 
And why do they think it was buried at sea? Is because it was found in sediment containing marine fossils. The other thing I love about this fossil is how well preserved it is and how it agrees with, again, the Bible's account of the earth and that this animal was only buried 4,000 years ago. You see, when a creature is fossilized, all of the soft tissues decompose and the hard tissues, the bones, absorb minerals from the, like the sand and mud around them until basically all of the bone is replaced with mineral and you basically have a, a stone. So like the bone turns into stone. That's, that's what most fossils are. But <clears throat> this dinosaur is not fully mineralized. It still has organic molecules like kerogen and skin pigments, and they have counted over 40 species of plant in its stomach. Like they cut it open and they found its stomach and they found 40 different species of plant. It's partially mineral, mineralized, but not fully. And this is exactly what you'd expect if the Genesis flood buried the ancient world 4,000 years ago. Even secular scientists admit that the organic tissues and molecules should not be there. And they have been scrambling for the last couple of years to come up with strange explanations of how you get organic material the last millions of years. So this leads us to, gen to Genesis flood evidence number five, which is soft tissue remains in dinosaur fossils. Anyone want to want to guess what that is? It's a red blood cell. That's right. It's a red blood cell of a Tyrannosaurus rex, which is kind of freaky to think about. It. And I got this picture from the Smithsonian Magazine, from the atheist Smithsonian Magazine website. And here's a quote from the Institute for Creation Research, one of my favorite uh, creationism resources. Paleontologists operating under the assumption that the Earth's strata, that's the layers of rock, that the Earth's strata represent millions or billions of years have not looked for fresh tissues within fossilized remains, because they shouldn't be there. But fresh biological material within some fossils has been there all along and is now continually being discovered despite the protests of biochemists who say that it should not exist. So molecules such as proteins, pigments, DNA, even intact cells like this red blood cell, and in some cases cells still grouped together in tissues have been found in fossils that are supposedly millions of years old. Whole organisms have been sealed in amber. Amber is, you know, that tree, tree sap that hardens into like an amber stone. If you've seen Jurassic Park, you know, it's all about the, <laughs> the bugs in the, in the sap. So uh, entire organisms have been found in amber, and there are even living microbes captured inside the amber. This testifies, again, evidence to the Bible's account of the earth. Obviously, the idea here is if you have soft tissue, it can't be millions of years old. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little bit more of the story of this, uh, this, this T-Rex and its red blood cells. So this is 1991. A scientist named Schweitzer was trying to study thin slices of bone from a 60, supposedly 65 million, million years old Tyrannosaurus rex. She was having a hard time getting the slides to stick to the piece of glass, and so she asked for, for some help from a molecular biologist at the university. Okay, not, not, not a paleontologist. This is a, you know, just a, a molecular biologist. And the biologist found it really interesting, so she borrowed the slides and took them to a veterinary conference and was showing them to people. And one of the veterinarians in the conference came up and said, do you know you have blood red cells, red blood cells in that um, bone? And so sure enough, under a microscope, she took a look and saw the red discs. And later, Schweitzer, not, not, not the, the original paleontologist, not, not, not the um, biologist, when she learned about this, she said, I looked at this, and I looked at this, and I thought, this can't be. Red blood cells don't preserve. It just didn't fit. It's like looking at that dead body with a hole in the chest and saying, wow, that really looks like somebody shot him, but it can't be, because I don't see a gunman. 
And so she actually, this um, secular scientist actually went on to find more soft tissues complete with blood vessels. This is soft tissue from the Tyrannosaurus rex. I mean, it makes sense if the Bible is true and God buried the ancient world 4,000 years ago, there could be some soft tissue still buried. All right, let's look at another evidence. <clears throat> let's go back to the rocks. Evidence number six is polystrate tree fossils. Poly means many, um, straight means layers, many layers, tree fossils. So this is just a fossilized tree that pokes through many layers of rock that supposedly took millions of years to accumulate. Obviously, that's logically impossible. A tree is not going to stand there for millions of years while sediment accumulates around it, but it does make complete and total sense if the tree was buried rapidly in a great flood. Now, some of you might wonder if this mud was all put down kind of all at once or in, you know, a couple of huge uh, waves, why are there so many little layers? Why, why the layered look? I want to show you a picture from the blizzard last weekend. Oh, I don't know if you can see that on the screen very well. This is a picture of snow. I, I opened the, um, the gate in the yard and the snow was piled up against the gate and it just stayed in the same shape. It was just full of many, many layers of snow from the night before. It just, just I don't know, the way God made things, when they pile up on the, on the ground, when sediment lands, it, it falls in a, in a layered in a layered manner. So, one blizzard, many layers. One 150-day-long global flood, many layers. Okay, this is evidence number seven out of ten. And this is one of my favorite ones. This is one of the most compelling evidences for the Genesis flood. Huge, huge, continuous sheets of sediment across vast areas. Okay, this is a slide I borrowed um, from Answers in Genesis. And I know you can't read any of that. <clears throat> I'm going to read it for you. Okay, the sedimentary rock layers that are exposed in the walls of the Grand Canyon, so these are the, the layers in the, in the Grand Canyon, belong to six huge, vast layers of sediment. They call, the, they call these mega sequences, but that just means, you know, a layer of sediment that can be traced across North America, figure three. So this is an example of one of these vast sediments of, it's, it's uninterrupted, huge layer of sand that just reaches across the whole country. And what's interesting is, I, um, the first time I read about these huge layers of sediment that, that reach across the whole country, they said, they, they, they spoke of one of them as being present in, um, where am I here? in the Grand Canyon, and they said the same sediment was visible in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, which is my hometown. And it's, I found that super interesting. At the base of these layers are huge boulders, that's figure four, this guy pointing at the boulders, and layers uh, and sand beds, figure five, that's the last picture on the right. These are all evidences of sediments being laid down rapidly across the entire USA. Same thing is true with coal beds. You'll find coal beds that are continuous across North America, England, and Russia. And by, by the way, ask a geologist what coal is. I, if you look on the U.S. Geological Survey website, it says coal is made from the plant remains of buried forests and marshes. So question, how do you think a forest or marsh gets buried? Okay. And this is, um, this is just more on this idea of the, the, the sediment and layers that span the entire earth. <clears throat> Genesis 7 explains that water covered all the high hills and all the mountains and that all air-breathing life on the land was swept away and perished. As part of the evidence of the flood, we would expect to find rock layers all over the earth filled with billions of dead animals and plants that were rapidly buried and fossilized in the mud. And that's exactly what we find even here in Twin Falls at Home Depot. We bought some sandstone stepping stones from Home Depot last summer to put in our backyard. And 
I got super excited when I started to look at the sandstone because you can find um, seaweed, fossilized seaweed in this sandstone. Anybody can come up and look at it afterward. It's, it's um, probably, can't see it from there. But you can distinctly see the shape of the stems and all the little um, leafy branches. And in the next layer down, like this chipped off of here, like it's flaked off, and you can see another layer of seaweed. And if you look at it from the edge, you can see many, many lines where it, it, it kind of gives the impression that there's many, many seaweed plants that got smashed and sandwiched in, together into this, this sandstone, just as we would expect from reading the Bible. Anybody can look at this afterward or buy some from Home Depot. We've got like five of these. <clears throat> Okay, evidence number eight, folded rock layers. The world has many places where the rock layers are bent or folded. Rocks are not soft enough to bend or fold. If you try to, they will snap. But these are smoothly bent. This means all these layers were at once soft at the same time, and it means they couldn't have been laid down gradually over millions of years. You find folded rock layers all over the world. I'll show you a few others. Again, they had to, be, had to have been soft when these sandwiches of rock were, were folded. Again, agreeing with the Bible's account of the earth. Evidence nine, massive, massive erosion. We won't take the time to really get into all the particulars here, but this is another evidence of the Genesis flood, is the large-scale erosion such as you find at the Grand Canyon. The best explanation for these canyons is that they were formed rapidly when the floodwaters receded from the earth and washed away the recently laid down sediments. The fact that the Grand Canyon actually cuts through a mountain range is further evidence to the fact that this couldn't have, ha you know, uh, couldn't have been cut by a river over millions of years. Rip rivers don't go you know, over mountains. They go typically downhill. And the last evidence that I want to cover this morning is actually not a geology evidence. It's more, you know, like anthropology type evidence. But I wanted to include it because of how powerfully it testifies to the Bible's account of the earth 4,000 years ago. So according to, to uh, Dr. Morris of the Institute for Creation Research, there are more than 200 cultures around the world that have an oral tradition passed down from ancient times of a global flood that came from God to judge the earth for the sins of mankind. There are, these stories are everywhere around the world. They vary in some of the details, but the core is the same. 88% of these stories say that one family was chosen to be saved and that they were, and, seven, and almost always they were saved on a boat and the animals with them. <clears throat> Quoting Dr. Morris, the most similar accounts, he's talking about most similar to the Bible's account, are typically from Middle Eastern cultures, but surprisingly, similar legends of a great flood are found in South America, the Pacific Islands, and elsewhere. Anthropologists will tell you that a myth is often the faded memory of a real event. Details may have been added, lost, or obscured in the telling and retelling, but the kernel of truth remains. When two cultures, when two separate cultures have the same myth, in their folklore, their ancestors must have either experienced the same event or they both descended from a common ancestral source which experienced that event. The only credible way to understand the widespread similar flood legends around the world is to recognize that all people living today, even though separated geographically and linguistically and culturally, have descended from the few real people who survived a real flood on a real boat which eventually landed on a real mountain. And their descendants now fill the globe, never to forget that real event. That was all from Dr. Morris. Anybody who's interested in any of my sources, I can share them with you. This morning, we've covered just a few, a few of the many evidences 
of the Bible's account of the earth. There is so much more we could cover from like radiocarbon dating to the, sol the, the salt levels in the ocean to mitochondrial DNA. That is one of the coolest ones. Basically the whole world, your mitochondrial DNA only comes from your mother and everybody in the world can be grouped into three genetic profiles for your mitochondrial DNA, which means the whole world comes from three moms, the three sons of, of Noah. So, I, anyway, there's just so much we could talk about. This was really just an introduction. So, if you, through your education, were influenced by uniformitarianism, I hope that this presentation will help you see the world through the lenses of the Bible's account of the earth. So when I learned how the flood explains the earth so much, to me, so much more compellingly and better than secular science, my confusion vanished. And when I realized um, <clears throat> that the secularists were, uh, were like the investigator trying to come up with an explanation and ignoring what was right in front of them, I realized how prejudiced they were against the facts. Now, I've mentioned education quite a few times this morning. I, I hope that you can see why from my experience. The greatest source of confusion in my Christian life came from having a secular education, which I have now since learned, and I can tell you, was a completely unnecessary struggle. Now, I never would have had this problem, and we would not be having a presentation this morning about uniformitarianism if American... Christians had not abandoned education to the secularists in the early 1800s. It started in New England and it spread across the country. Most creation science presentations will end here, but I, I feel compelled to offer and submit to you to consider a few more thoughts about this topic of education because of how impactful it is. Now, you have a building here that is still standing, still maybe strong in its bones, but it is being torn down. And I would, I would wonder how long, how much longer it can stand being hit by a wrecking ball and a jackhammer. As I said earlier, I propose to you that education either builds up Christian faith or tears down Christian faith. I I personally believe that there is no neutrality in education. And if you do think that there's neutrality in education, you might ask yourself, even if you could have a spiritually neutral education, would that even be a good thing? To be spiritually neutral. Neutral, I looked it up this morning. Neutral in Webster's Dictionary it says, it, to be neutral is to be not engaged in either side. To be neutral is to not take an active part in either, with either of contending parties. To be neutral is to be indifferent and have no bias in favor of either side, or to take no part in a contest. If you ask me, a spiritually neutral education would tear down Christian faith. So as I was saying, I believe there is no real neutrality. Like Jesus said, you're either gathering with him or scattering abroad. And I would suggest that the rapid de-Christianization of America over the last hundred years is directly tied to the secularized, secularization of education, tearing down the Christian faith of America. You know, Jesus told his disciples they'd be like a city on a hill. And I think of a city on a hill as having a... A lot of, I mean, if, if Jesus' disciples are going to be a city, it is going to be a beautiful city, and it is going to be a substantial city, not a bunch of mud huts. How many of the buildings in the city on the hill have to be torn down before God's people will become like Nehemiah and take up the task of rebuilding the buildings and building the walls of Christian faith through Christian education once again. 
I don't know about you, but I want to choose the kind of education that builds a great edifice of Christian faith instead of tearing it down. One that trains the mind to agree rather than to suspect the teachings of the Bible in every subject. And to make God's word the authority over all of life, over every single subject and over every sphere and institution. I submit to you that Christian education is much more than adding a Bible class to the schedule or scrubbing Darwinism from the biology curriculum. I once heard Michael Ferris, Rachel and I heard Michael Ferris speak in uh, Nampa about 10 years ago, and he quoted Dorothy Sayers as saying, if you separate God from education, in the mind of the child, you separate God from everything. And if that is the case, it is not surprising that 75% of Christian children, children of Christian parents, reject Christianity if they have a secular education. And nearly 80% of children of Christian parents who have a Christian education go on to give their children a Christian education. And this is my last slide. What I've attempted to do this morning is to make the subject of geology subject to the Bible instead of being subject to man. The Apostle Paul said, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So I propose to you that every thought is either raised up against the knowledge of God or is taken captive to the obedience of Christ. To bring our thinking under the Bible is spiritual warfare. In the preceding verse, Paul actually uses and speaks of this, uh, speaks of the weapons of warfare and the destruction of strongholds. And Paul also said in his letter to the Romans, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. The alternative, if you think about it, if you don't subject your mind to the Bible, is that you will reject what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect, which is what we see all around us in the culture, on the news, is people rejecting God's will because their mind has not been subjected to the Bible. So spiritual warfare takes place in our thinking. I had that battle I told you about when I was 12 years old, grappling with the contradictions between my education and the Bible. I was in the crosshairs of a spiritual battle. It's my prayer that as a body we will not see education as something separate from God's kingdom, nor will we see education as just like an appendage to God's kingdom, but that we will see education as the very battleground upon which his kingdom is either advanced or abandoned. So, Father, I thank you for our time here today, considering the profound impact that human philosophies have had in bringing confusion to the body of Christ. I thank you, Lord, that your word is truth and that it removes all confusion and frustration so that we may have peace, and peace more abundantly. As I said at the beginning of this message, the purpose for which we are here this morning is to build biblical faith. And so I pray for each one listening this morning that each person will be strengthened in their childlike confidence in the Bible and all of its declarations, and that each of us will take careful heed to the philosophy of education we choose for our families so that the generation to come might be built up spiritually like a mighty fortress for our God. In Jesus' name, amen.